Now let's have a look at the synovial joints. So firstly, what is a synovial joint? I spoke to you about those various classes of joints and I told you that you can have fibrous joints, cartilaginous joints and synovial joints. I told you the first two fibrous joints and cartilaginous joints are quite immobile joints. Sometimes they're fully immobile or sometimes they're partly immobile. But when we start talking about freely movable joints, what we're referring to are the synovial joints. And there's a couple of points about synovial joints which make them very specific and very particular. So what I've drawn here, to the best of my ability, is a synovial joint. So let's point out a couple of important regions anatomically and discuss what they do. So first thing I want to highlight is we have two long bones. So we have one long bone here articulating with another long bone here. So this could be either the humerus with potentially it could be the glenohumeral point but it's not necessarily because it's two long bones so it must be the knee for example. So this could be where the uh, tibia comes into the femur. Now a couple other things. These little swirls that I've drawn, this indicates the spongy bone and then what you can't see towards the outside of the bone is what we call the compact bone. Now I've filmed a video looking at the differences between compact bone and spongy bone so please watch that and you can see that in this little cavity in the middle of these long bones which we call the medullary cavity we've got some yellow bone marrow which is fat so it's an ability it, the medullary cavity is one place that we can store energy in that form of fat. We've also got this little line that I've drawn here on both of these long bones. Now this is what we call the epiphyseal line also known as the epiphyseal plate and this is when children are growing up. I've spoken to you previously about in the epiphyses so you've got your whole long bone the diaphysis is the shaft of the bone, the epiph epiphysis is on both ends, the proximal epiphysis, distal epiphysis, and in this epiphysis there is a plate that when you were younger this plate was cartilaginous and would allow for bone growth to occur. So it would secrete all this extracellular matrix and then calcium and phosphate would come along and harden that bone. So as an adult, this bone starts to ossify and harden and it just becomes what we call the epiphyseal line. In addition to that we can see this blue line that I've drawn that's articular cartilage which I've spoken to previously as being of the subtype of hyaline cartilage and it's this glassy smooth cartilage at articulating bone surfaces so bones can glide across and create a frictionless environment. To aid in that frictionless environment we have this membrane here which is typical of synovial joints and it's called the synovial membrane and it releases a fluid in the joint capsule space called synovial fluid and again this fluid reduces friction. We've also got the fibrous portion of this capsule so the capsule here is made up of the synovial membrane and the fibrous membrane here which sort of encapsulates the whole joint part. You can also see we've drawn a little bit of the periosteum, which is the outside aspect of the bone. Now the periosteum goes along the outside aspect of all bones. However, when it comes to an area of articular cartilage, there is no longer any periosteum. It then turns into articular cartilage. So now what I want to talk about are the different subtypes of synovial joints how freely movable they are and where you can find them in the body with the help of our friend Frank. So, firstly, when we look at the synovial joints, we can So what I've just done there is, in my own head, I've got a mnemonic for the joints, for the uh, synovial joints. And a mnemonic is where you take the first letter of every word and you attribute it another word that's easier to remember than simply saying planar, hinge, pivot, and so forth. Okay? 
Now, usually I'll tell you what the mnemonic is, such as when we do the 12 cranial nerves, we go, oh, 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 to touch and feel very good. Velvet are heaven. For the epidermal layer of the integumentary system, we say, come, let's get sunburned for the five layers of the epidermis. Now this one, unfortunately, if I were to tell you, I would get fired because it's too disgusting for me to say. So in saying that, this is a good opportunity for you to create your own type of mnemonic. Now, let me tell you what these three, four, five, six different types of synovial joints are. First one is called a planar joint. The next one is called a hinge joint. Then we have a pivot joint. Then we have a condylar joint, a saddle joint, and a ball and socket joint. Now, I have intentionally drawn it up three, two, one, because this is the order in which they go from least movable to most movable, or I should say, moving in the least amount of planes going to the most amount of planes. Let me tell you what I mean. Planar hinge and pivot joints of synovial joints are uniaxial. Uniaxial means it only moves in one plane, either back and forth or up and down, left and right, for example. Condylar and saddle joints are biaxial You can move in two planes, which means they can go either forward and back, and up and down, for example. Ball and socket joints are multi-axial, and therefore they can not just move up and down, and left and right, and forward and back, and diagonally, and so forth. They basically can move in many directions. So you probably know what type of joint is a ball and socket joint. Okay, now, a planar joint. A planar joint is basically like two flat pieces of material coming together and they will either just move up and down or forward and back. So that's a planar synovial joint. Where can we find a planar synovial joint? Well, let's bring Frank into the picture. A planar synovial joint is the type that you can find in the hand. Now, the hand has many different types of bones. So please remember that you will have your carpals here, your metacarpals here, and then your phalanges sorry, here. So carpals, metacarpals, then you can have your proximal phalanx, middle phalanx, distal phalanx. The place that you can find the planar joint is at the carpals, in what we call the intercarpal joint. So between carpals are where you can find planar joints. So we can write intercarpal joint. Intercarpal joint. What about a hinge joint? This one's pretty easy because you know what a hinge is. The hinge is something you can see on a door and basically it moves the way my arm can move, which means that a hinge joint is the type of joint you would find between the ulna and the humerus. So the ulna humerus joint here is a hinge joint. Okay, well what about pivot joint? What's a pivot joint? Well, a pivot joint is basically when you have something like this, which can pivot around like that, so spinning around. So where could we find a joint that can spin? Well, if we have a look at Frank again, and let's turn him around, if we have a look at his vertebrae, now, again, 
I've recorded a video on the vertebrae, so you can watch the video on the vertebral column. Very simply, you've got different types. You've got cervical vertebrae, thoracic vertebrae, lumbar vertebrae, sacral, and coccygeal. And if you look at the seven cervical vertebrae, the top two, C1 or cervical 1, C2, cervical 2, are quite different. The very top, C1, is also known as the atlas. Why is it called the Atlas? Do you know that Roman god, I think it's a Roman god or Greek god, that's holding the world above him, holding that world up? Well, that's synonymous, or at least trying to be synonymous, with this Atlas, the C1, holding the skull above it. The one below it is called the Axis, okay? And the reason why it's called the Axis is because it spins on an axis. So, C1, Atlas, holding the world above it. C2, axis, because it spins around, which means that C2, cervical vertebrae 2, is a good example of a pivot joint. So there's a cervical vertebrae, sorry about my writing, C2. Okay, what about a condylar joint? So we're now moving into the biaxial realm. A condylar joint... sort of looks like that. So it sort of can rock back and forward and left and right. That's a condylar joint. So if we can have a look to see where we can find a condylar joint, we take frack again. Condylar joint is the typical joint that you would find between the metatarsal and the proximal phalanx. So between the metatarsal and the proximal phalanx, that joint there is what we call the condylar joint. metacarpal and proximal phalanx. All right, saddle joint. Think about somebody sitting on the saddle of a horse. So how does that look? Well, the saddle of the horse sort of looks quite strange. And then the joint coming in looks quite strange as well. So it's not the best drawing. Let me try that again. Obviously I'm not the best drawer. I do apologise. But a saddle joint sort of looks a little bit like that. It's a pretty terrible drawing. But think of sitting on a saddle of a horse. Apart from that being so terrible, let me give you an example as to where you can find a saddle joint. One simple place is if, again, you take the hand, a lot of these joints can be found in the hand, take the thumb from the metacarpal to one of the carpals here, which we call the trapezius. So the trapezium here, we go from the metacarpal to one of the carpals here in the thumb. That is going to be what we call a saddle joint. Alright, last one, ball and socket. This one's easy. Think of a ball, think of the ball being inside of a socket. That's what you can find here at the glenohumeral joint. I'll bring Frank into the picture. The glenohumeral joint, meaning the ball or the head here of the humerus inside the scapula here, glenohumeral joint, or even the head of the femur in at the hip. Both of these are examples of ball and socket joints. Now, even though they're multi-axial, some of these have less movement than others and some have more movement. So, for example, the shoulder has greater movement inside of that joint, but it's weaker, while the hip has less movement inside that joint and it's stronger. Okay, so let's write down two examples of ball and socket. We can write glenohumeral glenohumeral joint, which is the humerus and the joint of the clavicle, 
and we can also say the femur and hip joint. And these are examples of synovial joints. So hopefully with the help of Frank that was helpful for you.